Ackerman this morning. Elizabeth. So Elizabeth's question is, some translation says, who always leads us in triumph, and the ESV says, leads us in triumphal procession, and the question, why? So in the Greek, it's one word, it's a verb, and so the verb may be translated to lead in triumph, to lead in triumphal procession, but that verb res refers to that specific event when uh, that occurred, so that's what they're doing there, just translating it to, I think I had actually... Um, yeah, it can be simply, the verb can be translated to triumph over, or to, but it refers to that specific event, so triumphing in, in triumphal procession. Good question. Any other questions? All right. Let us, and so what we're going to see is Paul here sets the stage, and he looks at the method of New Covenant ministry, particularly how God uses a suffering servant like the suffering servant to uh, proclaim the gospel. This is getting people's attention. Um, but what we're going to see is, like some of the verses that I read to you when I said watch and listen to Paul came from chapter 4 and chapter 6. And so we're going to come back to this theme of suffering but we're going to see different elements uh, in it. So, for example, you're going to see how God's power is displayed or how God's glory is displayed. So Paul is going to look at it then with a greater intensity. Um, but you think, for example, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where this is the chapter where Paul complains about his thorn in the flesh. So this is on his mind. And remember what God says there. He says that my power is made perfect in your weakness, and Paul says, okay, I can accept that. That God, God can't show himself to be God when we are self-sufficient. When life is going smoothly and we're setting it, set it at cruise control at 80 miles per hour and just flying down the interstate, but it's here that God can showcase the gospel. Yes. Right, so Elizabeth says often in these sufferings, it doesn't feel like a triumphal procession, if I'll add a few words to it. There doesn't seem to be a lot uh, to be joyful about, uh, but in fact, sometimes it's in these suffering that we actually see our sin more acutely. The dross seems to be coming out. But think about that. Even that is the fragrance of Christ because the unbeliever in the trial gets harder. The believer gets weaker. In a trial, the, the unbeliever is stoic, and the believer is, uh, what's the opposite of stoic? He's, uh, he's broken, he's wounded. Uh, the unbeliever says, this doesn't hurt me, and the believer says, this touches me right here. And so uh, the, believer, the unbeliever says, I'm okay, don't worry about me. The believer says, I'm not okay. And so we're, we're vulnerable, we're broken, we see the sin in our, we see our own uh, contribution to this. But what does the church see? Like, they, they hear that, they see the believer suffering and they hear him say, you know what, I, I did this to myself, let's say if there's sin coming out. Or, or it's in that moment that you're, you're, you're talking to your brothers and your sisters and you're saying, I see my sin more clearly now than I saw it before. That's the fragrance of the cross. The cross exposes sin. You know, so uh, we're relying on Christ. We're not relying on ourselves. We're not trying to cover up, but we're exposing, we're disclosing. It doesn't mean that we're airing our dirty laundry for the whole church to see, but it means that we're living transparently in, in a way that is, is humble and meek and poor in spirit. And suffering does all of that. It just, it's like kneading the dough, you know, and that leaven works itself through all the dough, and the dough rises. And then what happens next? You get the wafting of freshly baked bread coming out of the oven. So um, it's actually good 
The dross is supposed to come out, and that too is the fragrance of the cross, sins being dealt with. Um, and oftentimes in the affliction of Paul, we're going to be thinking about this over the next number of weeks, and um, I pray God give me grace that it doesn't seem heavy. Uh, we might even take a break if I feel the need to. Uh, but we're looking at new covenant ministry and how the Lord reproduces, reenacts the gospel in our lives, and that draws attention to Christ. And so in your own suffering, you know, realize that people are watching. You know, we know that when we're going through a hard time, the kids are watching, the church community is watching, your neighbor's watching, the person you're working with is watching. How are you handling um, this particular incident? You know, our Elizabeth's sister lost her baby. How does she walk through this valley? How does she handle it? What are her responses? We're all watching and we're smelling, smelling. And, and we don't want to give the smell of stale bread. We want to give the smell of a freshly baked loaf just brought out of the oven, you know? So we don't do this well all the time. Um, and, and God knows that we are sinful, you know, sinful creatures. Uh, but it's something to be put in front of us that this is what we are. We are in the triumphal procession and it's been given to us this responsibility in affliction and suffering to be an aroma of Christ and not the aroma of, of bitterness or resentment. You know, that would have been the unbeliever, you know, in the train. Uh, the Roman captives would have been bitter. Uh, they're going to their death. Why can Paul be thankful? It's because Christ saved them. Christ is redeeming his sorrows. That's a glorious thing. Christ redeems our sorrows and uses them for his glory. That's the most amazing thing in all this world, you know. Ava. Yeah. Humiliation of consciousness, maybe I think you're saying just these trials and whatnot have a way of just bringing us down to being poor in spirit, being meek and humble, and, and letting the Lord shine through our sorrows. And that's what we're trying to do. And it is, it, does, it, it really does. It's a change of heart. It gets down to your heart attitude. It always gets down to your attitude. And say, Lord, use me. Use this trial to showcase Christ. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, yeah, so I look forward to sharing that in the weeks to come. Uh, again, so I did cut it short. We did not get to the second half of 16. Who is sufficient? And maybe that's kind of where I left you hanging. It's like, who, who's up for this? Who can do this? You know, I think that's often, I, yeah, Kathy was sharing me, with me. She's like, I didn't share your enthusiasm about suffering, you know? And uh, so I think that's where Paul takes us. It's like, ah. <laughs> Who's ready for this? Did we sign up for this? And so that's where we'll go next week. Who is sufficient? And um, it's actually really exciting. And then go on. Paul, Paul then is going to go on chapter 3 to show the glory of new covenant ministry. This doesn't look very glorious, does it? But glory is going to shine through. So some really exciting things to go to. All right. Um, let's turn our attention to the doctrine of man. I hope that we can finish this off. Let's turn, first of all, in the Belgic Confession. Page 859, The Creation and Fall of Man. We've been studying about what it means to be made in God's image, have an enfleshed, soul, a soul that's clothed in flesh, a soul that's righteous, a soul that has a spiritual, is spiritual in nature. Article 14, The Creation and Fall of Man, page 859. We believe that God created man from the dust of the earth and made and formed him in his image and likeness, good, just, and holy, able by his own will to conform in all things to the will of God. But when he was in honor, he did not understand it and did not recognize his excellence. 
but he subjected himself willingly to sin and consequently to death and the curse, lending his ear to the word of the devil. For he transgressed the commandment of life, which he had received, and by his sin he separated himself from God, who was his true life, having corrupted his entire nature. So he made himself guilty and subject to physical and spiritual death, Having become wicked, perverse, and corrupt in all his ways, he lost all his excellent gifts, which he had received from God, and he retained none of them except for small traces, which are enough to make him inexcusable. Moreover, all the light in us is turned to darkness. As the scripture teaches us, the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness did not receive it. Here John calls men darkness. Therefore, we reject everything taught to the contrary concerning man's free will, since man is nothing but the slave of sin and cannot do a thing unless it is given him from heaven. For who can boast of being able to do anything good by himself? Since Christ says, no one can come to me unless my Father who sent me draws him. Who can glory in his own will when he understands that the mind of the flesh is enmity against God? Who can speak of his own knowledge in view of the fact that the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God? In short, who can produce a single thought, since he knows that we are not able to think a thing about ourselves by ourselves, but that our ability is from God? And therefore, what the Apostle says outrightly ought rightly to stand fixed and firm. God works within us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. For there is no understanding nor will conforming to God's understanding and will apart from Christ's work, as he teaches us when he says, without me, you can do nothing. Let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. We will read about the fall of Adam and Eve in sin. First of all, in Genesis chapter 2, we read about the test that was given them. In Genesis chapter 2 at verse 15, we read the following. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And now let's start at chapter 3 at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. 
To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That must have been a hard word for Adam to hear. We remember what it was we saw last two weeks ago to be made in God's image. It means principally this, that man was made for God. And God now says to Adam, I'm going to return you to dust. Really was a painful moment even with the promise of the gospel and the seed of the woman crushing the serpent's head. Um, have you ever done something bad? And you went, no, I can't. These, not right. Ever done anything bad and you, you wish you could undo it? Take it back? When the word's spoke and you can't retract the word, you know, this was one of those moments where Adam and Eve would have been like, can you try that over again? What a word. Let's think about the fall of man. I've got to turn in my bulletin. There's some blanks that we can be filling out. So the fall of man, the test, the fall, and the consequences. So we read about the test in verse 15 through 17. God puts a tree in the middle of the garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he tells Adam and Eve that they can't eat from this tree. They can eat from every other tree, but not this one. And we think here of, uh, of a few things that God was incredibly generous. He didn't say, uh, I want you to, you can eat of half of the trees, but half of them are off limits. He didn't say 40% or 20% or 10% are off limits. He says, the garden's beautiful, it's paradise. And every fruit of the garden and every seed is beautiful and delicious. Uh, but there's one tree, just, just one. Don't eat that one. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God was testing Adam and Eve with a simple act of pure obedience. A few blanks already you can be filling in. God commanded Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so uh, this was the commandment of life. It's the next blank. This was the commandment of life. And so, and that's what we get. We get that terminology from the Belgic Confession. We believe that covenant theology is the best expression of the narrative of scripture, of the plan of redemption, that God enters into relationship with man, a relationship we've called a covenant. And that's not our term, that's God's term. We don't see the word covenant used of this relationship before sin, but we see the elements of a covenant, a relationship. There are terms, responsibilities, promises, obligations. So all the ingredients are there, so it enables us to call it a covenant. And we call this here commandment of life because if he kept this commandment he would live how do we know that because God said if he didn't keep the commandment he would die so those are the opposites God said that in the day that you eat of it you will surely die so uh, the second sent or third sentence it expressed a covenant of works now that's very critical here covenant of works see God told Adam something Adam had to do. Adam, I want you to not eat of this tree. So he had to do something. He had to not eat of it. 
And so there's a prohibition there. So this was a covenant of works, which if Adam kept it, we believe that he would have in time been allowed to eat from the tree of life. That's the other tree. We don't assume or presume that he had eaten from the tree of life because once um, he eats from the forbidden tree, he's banned from the tree of life. You say, well, why didn't he eat from the tree of life? Well, perhaps because God hadn't told him he couldn't eat of it. And, uh, you know, who knows? But he maybe knew that this one, too, he shouldn't eat from. He had all the other trees. But it was the forbidden tree that attracted his attention. And uh, so let's look at Romans chapter 5 because what we're going to see is this fact that there is a covenant of works given Adam here in the garden. In Romans chapter 5 at verse 18, Paul writes as follows, Romans 5, verse 18, Therefore, as one trespass, so speaking about Adam, one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So Paul contrasts works. He contrast, contrasts obedience. One man's failure to obey versus another man's obedience. And so what we're looking at as we think about Adam is he was put in a relationship with God where God says, here are the terms. You will live in my presence forever and ever and ever if you obey me a covenant of works. But if you disobey me, the covenant's broken and the curses, covenants have curses, they have promises and curses. If you break it, then the curses come upon you. God says, here's the covenant, if you obey me, we live forever, you live forever. If you disobey me, the curses come upon you, principally, you die. And uh, why do we want to stress this covenant of works is because it enables us to understand what Christ does. In the covenant of grace, which follows the covenant of works, Jesus is fulfilling the covenant of works. Adam, God says, Adam, you need to keep it in order to live. What does God say even in the covenant of grace with regard to the Ten Commandments? The man who does them shall live by them. So Christ comes in a covenant of grace to fulfill this covenant of works. And Paul says that very much when he says, by one man's obedience. So we're still thinking covenant of works, but we're seeing Christ redoing it in this new relationship with us in a covenant of grace. But Christ's obedience fulfills the covenant of works and is given to us as our righteousness. So, uh, not to belabor that any further, but we see here that there's a covenant, a commandment of life, expressing a covenant of works made with Adam. If he fails, then the curses come upon him. Let's look at the fall. Was there any defect in Adam and Eve which made it likely that they would eat from the forbidden tree? The Belgic Confession is very clear that there was no reason why Adam and Eve had to fail. God did not set them up for failure. They were made perfect. They were pure. God said that they were very good. There was no defect in the, in that made the fall probable or likely. He was made in God's image and likeness, and thus he was very good. He willingly chose to listen to and to obey Satan. The Belgic says that he subjected himself willingly to sin and consequently to death and the curse, lending his ear to the word of the devil. This makes the fall or all the more tragic, that um, there was no reason for him to fail, you know. It's like, think of a racehorse, the fastest racehorse in the world, They're, you know, let out of the gates. There's no reason why this horse is not going to place first. It is the best. Um, Adam and Eve were perfect. There was no reason for them to fail. 
Uh, God was good to them. So this makes the fall all the more tragic. But we do see how Satan accomplishes this feat. Uh, not, first of all, by not flat out contradicting God, but by degrees, insinuating, undermining, suggesting, uh, contradicting, until finally just completely uh, saying the very opposite, you will not surely die, just completely contradicting God. Uh, we see how Eve, uh, first of all, uh, saw the fruit and appealed to her eyes, her senses, and then it appealed to her mind that would make her wise. And oftentimes Satan works the same way today, appealing, first of all, to our external senses of sal smell, sight, what we hear, you know, and, and it works in through the senses, but then it registers in the mind. So Satan here likes to work this way. It's effective, and we need to be on our guard, even guarding our senses, what we see, what we touch, what we smell, what we hear, etc., what we read, um, but anyways, the, the intent this morning is not to take apart the fall, um, but to just see that it happened. Uh, one little point, because I often will hear people say that, uh, you know, Adam was, uh, you know, off somewhere else, whatever. But it says in Genesis that Adam was with her. So Adam was just performing a science experiment with his wife as the guinea pig. God said that in the day we eat of it, we'll die. So here you, Eve, you take the fruit, and I'll see if you die. Um, so Adam here was not doing his part. He should have interceded, uh, intervened. He should have said, Eve, let's walk away from the tree. Uh, this is not good, but he didn't. So they fell into sin. Let's look at the consequences, and we won't finish it off, but we'll get into it. What did God say would happen to Adam and Eve the moment that they ate from the forbidden tree? God said that the day that he ate of it, he would surely die. Chapter 2, verse 17. All that happened to Adam and Eve in that fateful moment can be, set, can be summarized in one word. Death. That itself has um, shock value to it. Um, to think that that in that single word, that word that we hate so much, death is an enemy, death is not our friend. That all the consequences of this rebellion against God and this rejection of God and this disobedience, all of the effects and consequences can be summarized in one word, death. Adam and Eve incurred guilt the moment they sinned. He separated himself from God. Communion with God was instantly destroyed. Before he feared God in holy reverence, now he was afraid of God. Uh, just reading Gentle and Lowly last night, it's the real gem of a book. I hope you guys are reading that book. Uh, but speaking in Gentle and Lowly, they're saying one of the, perhaps the most tragic consequences of sin is that we think wrong thoughts of God. Well, how often do I repent, Father, forgive me for thinking wrongly of you? That God is hard, that he's harsh. Satan tempted Eve with wrong thoughts of God. God's not good, really. He's holding out on you. He incurred guilt and he separated himself from God. Communion and fellowship were destroyed. He thought wrong thoughts about God. He subjected himself instantly to physical and spiritual death. At that very second, he began to age. Death entered his body. Spiritual death especially. Horrible thoughts entered his heart. And so what the catechism or the confession here does, look at the bullet point, second bullet point, 4.3. The doctrine that describes the extent, that's important to underline there, the extent to which sin's corruption affected man is called total depravity. Total depravity describes the extent to which their fall affected their being. It affected their mind, their will, their heart, their thoughts, their speech, 
their feelings and emotions. Um, it affected their relationships. It affected their work. It affected their play. It affected their children that would be coming forth from them. Total depravity says that sin has infected us totally. These are quotes from the Belgic. Having corrupted his entire nature, having become wicked, perverse, and corrupt in all his ways, he lost all his excellent gifts. All the light in him turned to darkness. He became a slave of sin. His mind is enmity against God. Not very positive. Uh, the third bullet point said man had become a slave of sin. Just stop for a second. We think, okay, how do we get the joy that Paul had in 2 Corinthians? Here's one way. is He was a slave of sin, and you and I were slaves of sin. Every child conceived is a slave of sin. And we know in our nation's history the stigma of slavery, and we're not proud of it. To be a slave of God is what it means to be free. Look at an addict. That's a classic example of an addict, a drug addict, because it's, it's just so unmistakable. The drug addict is a slave to meth. And just keep going back to meth, and you're like, are you kidding me? Just keeps going back to it. But that's a vivid picture of what we all are in our human nature, a slave, a slave to sin. Now, Paul, you see why Paul can be so thankful. I would rather be in Christ's triumphal procession going to my execution free in Christ. A slave of Christ is better than a slave of Satan. And so Paul can rejoice and we can rejoice. We are slaves, slaves of God. We will bind those chains around our neck and wear them with pride like a gold necklace with jewels and diamonds. Slave of Christ. That's the definition of freedom. Man had become a slave of sin. So what we're going to do next week is we're going to finish this off looking at does man have a free will? Something that um, there's a lot of confusion about. Does fallen man after the fall have a free will? And um, well, if you know that he's a slave of sin, then there is no freedom there, is there? Uh, he is a slave. So, But God frees the will. That's where we're going to look next week. So let's worship the Lord.